Uh, This morning we are in Daniel chapter 3, and uh, we are looking at Nebuchadnezzar and the golden image, and uh, we are in now one of the most classic Bible stories ever told, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace. And uh, I'm going to do a a tag team on this uh, message in chapter 3. This week I'm going to do the first 18 verses, and next week Pastor Peter is going to do the rest of the chapter. He's actually going to get to talk about the fiery furnace itself. I'm just going to talk about the prelude. But there's so much in this chapter that uh, it felt like it was wise to just take it in two pieces. So we are going to look at verses 1 through 18 of Daniel chapter 3 today. So I want to invite you to stand in honor of God's word as I read it aloud and as we give it our undivided attention. These are the words of the living and the true God. Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, You are all to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless our time in it this morning. You may be seated. I never knew that there were bagpipes in the book of Daniel. I didn't know how the Scotsman got there. There are all kinds of instruments here in unison asking and begging for one thing to happen. 
and I'm looking forward to unpacking this passage with you together today. We are here in week three of the book of, uh, I'm sorry, chapter three of the book of Daniel, a couple of cha- uh, weeks into this. And uh, we're looking at Daniel as he's a faithful guide for us, for kingdom faithfulness in the midst of a culture that's contrary to Christianity. And I think um, here is really where we see some of the contrary reality happening because the first and second commandments of the Decalogue, to have no other gods and to make no other idols and do not bow down or serve them, is exactly what is at stake right before these three Hebrew children, as we know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, the title of this message is, But If Not, drawn from that final verse, verse 18. You know, you know, the Bible has been the basis of hundreds of allusions and quotations in culture. Things that the Bible says are echoes in our culture because we are a culture that has been historically steeped in the Bible. Let me give you a few examples. A fly in the ointment comes out of Proverbs. An eye for an eye comes out of the uh, Pentateuch. The handwriting is on the wall. We're going to see that in a few weeks with um, uh, the handwriting on the wall in the, in the courts of the palace. Eat, drink, and be merry. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Go the extra mile. The apple of my eye. I mean, I could go on and on. Pastors like to do this. Ask my kids. We love puns. We like playing with words, and we love these kind of things. How many of you have heard the phrase, uh, that person has feet of clay? That really ties into last week's, right, with the idol, and at the bottom is the feet of clay that gets hit by the stone. It's talking about vulnerability of mankind. And um, we saw that, that image, actually, last week in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and there's an important shift here where we're going from that uh, idol that he saw in his vision of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, to now, what's he doing? He's making an idol, and it's solid gold, not just a head of gold, And we're going to talk about the meaning of that. Now, in today's passage is a very famous biblical phrase that historically was used at a very important point in history. And I want to tell you that story before we get into this uh, story here. That phrase, but if not. Their reply to King Nebuchadnezzar included this phrase, but if not, O king. And did you know that in 1940, when France fell to the Nazis, there were about 350,000 British soldiers that were trapped on an island called Dunkirk. If you've seen the movie Dunkirk, you know the the historical situation. The situation was dire because they were completely surrounded on all three sides and the English Channel on the other side between them and their homeland. There was no military naval rescue possible for these 350,000 soldiers. They were sitting ducks. The commander wanted to relay a message to the naval authorities in Britain to let them know that the situation was so dire. But he didn't want to give away too much, lest he signal to the Nazis how vulnerable they truly were. And so, he decided that he would deliver a three-word cable back to London, and he delivered these three words. But, if, not. Full stop. These words were instantly recognizable to the people who were accustomed to hearing the scriptures in church. And they immediately in their minds went to Daniel chapter 3 and they knew that that commander was telling them he was about to be thrown into a fiery furnace. (laughs) The situation was desperate. The allied forces were trapped. It would take a miracle to save them, but they were determined not to give in. One simple three-word phrase communicated all of that in one short message. For some reason, people still are not sure why the Axis powers hesitated. They backed off briefly, and what's known as the miracle of Dunkirk took place. British families and fishermen took their own boats and pleasure cruisers and whatever they could give, and they went across to Dunkirk and took soldiers by the boatload back and forth all the way across, and they evacuated more than 338,000 soldiers almost overnight. Amazing how the Bible can have such an impact on a moment like that. But the original but if not is right here in this passage. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learned this lesson, or lived out this lesson rather. Only the God who is able to deliver you is worthy of your unconditional obedience. Let me say that one more time. This is the point of the message. 
Only the God who is able to deliver you is worthy of your unconditional obedience. Today we're going to follow that by looking at an outline here in just three simple points. Number one, saints under pressure. Number two, saints nonconformity. And then number three, saints in the hands of a mighty God. Well, as I said, this, uh, we start with the saints under pressure here. And uh, what happened there in chapter 2 of Nebuchadnezzar having the dream interpreted and understanding that he is that head of gold has suddenly turned idolatrous. King Nebuchadnezzar has, wants to interpret everything about himself. And I guess that's what happens when you're um, a megalomaniac and you, you own the whole world and you just think it can all be about you and you have the, pen, the power of death to sway everyone to do exactly what you want. Now remember, the arc of this is that God is on mission. He's reaching out to King Nebuchadnezzar. He is disrupting his life. He is speaking. He is revealing things to him so that he will come around and worship the one true and living God. And a week or two, we'll talk about the structure and how uh, the structure of this middle section of Daniel points right toward that outcome in Nebuchadnezzar. But he's still a long ways off. <laughs> He's in the category right now of exercising in, exercises and missing the point. <laughs> he's missed the point of the statue. He's now made it a, an idol of worship that he's requiring everyone to bow down to. One commentator says it this way. This action on the hands of Nebuchadnezzar was a defiant statement asserting that there would be no end to his kingdom or no quote-unquote after this with respect to his kingdom, like Daniel said that back there in chapter 2. But rather, Nebuchadnezzar's glory would continue forever. He is defiantly establishing and presenting himself as the one who will never end. The head is gold, the body is gold, the legs are gold, the feet are gold. Solid gold. Probably plated, but gold nonetheless. And uh, he is making a very strong statement. And this is idolatry on steroids, right? I mean, uh, the measurement is probably that this is about 90 feet high and nine and six feet wide. So the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But imagine that. I mean, that's like really tall. It's like a big missile silo that's ready to, you know, be sent off from Cape Canaveral or, you know, a really, la a really large tower. And the problem of idolatry, of course, is that when man puts himself at the top, when he deifies himself, he ends up dehumanizing humanity. Idolatry always leads to despicable problems among people. And Nebuchadnezzar here, the form that it takes is this demand for conformity, that all the people pay homage to him through the statue under penalty of death. And I want to note that there's, there are kind of two kinds of pressure that the saints come under. I think we can identify with uh, one of the two uh, levels of pressure. The first pressure is soft pressure. The second pressure is hard pressure. This is a story of hard pressure, but let's go back a step and just look at the soft pressure that was at work in all of this. Soft pressure is the pressure without coercion or without consequence, but rather the pressure of conformity to go along to get along. Because, as it were, everyone is doing it. And this passage, literally everyone is doing it, aren't they? Except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, think about the pressure that these guys are under, right? There's all of these officials. Everyone's there. You got the long list of satraps, prefects, and all these officials. And you got the music. It's an official, dignitary, political event away from the city, out there on the plain of Dura, and everyone's there, and everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, and it's all set up. And this is what soft pressure is beginning to feel like. And even without the threat of death by fiery furnace, you can feel the pressure that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would feel even without the hard pressure, right? Think about how hard it is to just stand strong against a condition where everyone is doing it. There's an interesting social psychologist named Solomon Ash, and he did what are called conformity experiments. They're social experiments where he would have people sign up to be in an experiment. It's a fascinating study. You can go look this up on your own time. I don't have time to do some of the examples, but he, he wanted to know what would happen if you put someone in a room where everyone was doing something false because they were planted there, and the one person who's the subject thinks everyone else is a subject, but doesn't know that they are the one who's being studied alone. 
So for an example, what he would do is he would have a, a poster board. He'd have 10 uh, people come into the room, nine of whom were all like told exactly what to do, and one of whom was unaware of the situation. And he'd have one line here that was like, say, two inches long, and then three other lines, one that was like three inches long, one inches long, and two inches long. And you're supposed to match up which lines were the same size, A, B, or C, the too long one, the too short one, or the, the right size one. And uh, what he would do is he would begin to do this, and he'd just start to you know, have people ask the question and say, give their answer. And all the people, the nine people, would say the wrong answer. And the study was, what happens to the person who's not aware that he's under scrutiny in this way when all the people are saying an untrue thing that everyone can certainly know is false? What do you think happened? Do you think conformity happened? Amazingly so. According to his research, 75% of those individuals who were, who were studied told a lie or told, went along with the group even though it was patently false at least one time during the pressure of the experiment. 75%. Now, of course, there's always a control group, right? Because like, maybe the lines were kind of too similar and you couldn't really tell. Guess what happened in the control group? 99% always right about the matching of line A, line B was the right answer. In fact, at one point, uh, his famous uh, quote from uh, Solomon Ash is this, the tendency to conformity in our society is so strong that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning young people are willing to call white black. This is a matter of concern. It raises questions about our ways of education and about the values that guide our, con our, our, our conduct. Hmm. Well, just, I mean, let's just pause there for one minute, right, on this thing. Uh, one clear application of this passage is choose your friends well. I mean, whether you realize it or not, the people you surround yourself, and this is not just for teenagers, okay? All of us have to choose our friends well. The people you surround yourself with, whether you realize it or not, you're going to start to want to be like them because it's the way sociology works. We, we want to belong. We want to be accepted. We want to be like other people. It's deeply embedded in our desire for connection with other people and will transgress boundaries that otherwise shouldn't be broken because we want to be like the people around us so that we can be accepted by them. So when you choose wise friends, you're going to be pressured to be more wise. That's actually a good thing. It's the positive side of this reality. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Whoever walks with the wise will be wise. You cannot control all the environments and influences around you, but you can control who your companions are, and you can control your mind. So whether it's corporate training, sexual ethics, LGBTQ, the pressure is on in politically correct discourse across culture. It's labeled tolerance, and the irony of tolerance is that there's an intolerance to tolerance. You with me there? Like, the way this goes is everyone needs to be tolerant. But if you don't take on our version of tolerant, we cannot tolerate you any longer. <laughs> Funny how that swings really hard. So sometimes it's just a matter of identifying that reality and saying, you know, I appreciate your desire for tolerance, but I want you to tolerate me as well and I just have the right to be a free citizen who has my own mind about things, and I hope that you'll allow me to respectfully disagree. Even that posture and that awareness can help us a lot when we feel like we're under fire, under soft pressure. So that's soft pressure. There's also hard pressure, right? Statism, despotism. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite stories of this is like Narnia and the story of uh, the the line, the witch in the wardrobe, right? And how Queen Jadis has taken over Narnia and it's always winter and never Christmas. And she has all of her enforcers out there to find out if anyone is in any way disobeying or spying or anything like that. And of course, our friend, the fawn Tumnus is uh, really bound up in this thing because he's met Lucy, but he's so fearful by the hard pressure that's on him that he feels the penalty of death He'll be turned into stone forever, so he thinks. 
Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are experiencing hard pressure. Our brothers and sisters around the world in various countries that are experiencing persecution are experiencing hard pressure. That's hard pressure. You're experiencing soft pressure. <laughs> They're experiencing hard pressure. Soft pressure, though, is the place where we practice how to stand under pressure. It's good to exercise our faith when it's not a matter of life and death, when it's a matter of faith in the Lord. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel had demonstrated that in chapter 1. By the way, we don't know where Daniel is in this chapter. Um, we think probably he was in another place at the time and was not required to be present for this event because of his lofty position that he'd gotten and by which he'd put these three guys uh, into other roles. So he's just absent from the story. Um, we don't know. I mean, obviously not all of the officials made it or were there. We certainly know Daniel didn't bow down, <laughs> but we wanted, we're looking at these three today. So don't let that bother you. Sorry, I brought it up. Now it is bothering you. Um, let's go on. <laughs> so that's the saints under pressure. Let's look at point number two, the saints nonconformity. So what happens, right? We all know the story, right? We just read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't bow down. They, they won't conform. And so what comes is a malicious accusation. The original language is something like the, their, their opponents, the, the Chaldeans, sought to tear them to pieces. And all the pressure comes to the king, right? O oh, king, live forever. O oh, king, you made this decree. You made this statue. You declared this. And now these guys you appointed won't bow down to your plan. So you better do something about it. That's how it comes. And they fully expect compliance from the king because he's got to do what he said he has to do. Otherwise, there's no integrity to this whole charade. And we'll see that he wouldn't really do what he says in terms of penalties. So he's got to hold through. And we see that these three men saw the idolatry for what it was and chose to act in what we will call, what I call, civil disobedience. That's what they're doing, right? There is a law that's been made, a directive, and they are going to disobey the directive, even though the directive comes from the king, even though the command is clearly given as a law or a command. Let's just define civil disobedience for a minute. Civil disobedience is the active and professed refusal of a citizen to obey certain laws, demands, or orders, or commands of a government or other authority that's usually rightful. Okay? We can think of lots of examples. Uh, John Bunyan, who wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, he wrote, wrote that book in jail, by the way. Why was he in jail? Because he was a Puritan who wasn't given a license from the Church of England to preach the gospel. But he won't let that stop him. So he preaches the gospel from house to house in people's homes. He's basically doing fellowship, and, and he's got the gift of preaching, so he gets up and, and speaks the word, and he gets arrested for preaching the gospel. Or uh, vaccine mandates. You remember those like three years ago? Hmm. I preached a sermon about that, by the way. If you want to go back and hear what I think about uh, civil disobedience and issues like that, you can go back and listen to that sermon from 2021 in the fall. Civil disobedience is the action of peacefully resisting authority that demands immoral or unjust actions. And here's the clincher. If you decide that you're going to participate in civil disobedience, you're going to do it respectfully, but before the Lord, and you agree in your mind ahead of time that whatever the consequence that is you know, threatened as a result of your disobedience, whether it's arrest or imprisonment, you're going to allow to happen. It's part of your statement. It's part of what you're going to do. Now, you can still appeal, and you should, but that's how laws get changed, right? When the judge says, hey, this person has this character, did this thing, and yet they, why are they in prison? This, this, there must be something wrong with our laws. Maybe this person isn't as guilty as we see. If and when you disobey, you agree to face the consequences head on and make your appeal. I think a great passage for this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. The writer of the book of Hebrews is telling those early Christians in the early church, quote, you had compassion on those in prison. Why were they in prison? Because they were preaching the gospel. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So there are times when Christians, when the saints will forego privileges or rights because before God they have to obey the Lord. Remember, that's the point of this message. 
only the God who is able to deliver you is worthy of your unconditional obedience, uh, unconditional obedience. Interesting example of this is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Back in 1963, he began to gather friends and fellow people to protest segregation. And what he did was he practiced intentionally peaceful protest, civil disobedience. And about 61 years ago, in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. was imprisoned for eight days in Birmingham, Alabama, on charges of parading, demonstrating, boycotting, trespassing, and picketing. Like, in other words, holding up a sign. And they threw in trespassing, because that, that one sounds pretty bad, right? While he was there in prison for those eight days, he wrote a letter explaining his, nine, his nonviolent protest and civil disobedience. It's called Letters from a Birmingham Jail. Uh, let me just read you a few quotes, because I think they help to understand the spirit of what this looks like in real, real life, okay? He wrote this, we know, that, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. He used nonviolence to call attention to people's plight, to black people's plight in particular in America. He said this, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands that the means we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. Like, so he desires good ends, but he's got to do it through good means. I've tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. In other words, he resisted some of his other uh, fellow black leaders um, like Malcolm X, who were ready to take a violent protest. He said, no, we are nonviolent protests. We have to do this with a moral way to get good means and good ends. He also says, but now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or perhaps even more so, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. This is his call out. He believed that he had a moral obligation to disobey unjust laws like segregation. He says this, one has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Uh, in the book Lex Rex, uh, Tama Rutherford says it this way, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Interesting concept. That's a big, thick book if you have time to read it. If you like to read, you can go read Lex Rex. Uh, King argued, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of the tension. We are merely bringing to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out into the open where it can be seen and dealt with. So, for example, uh, sitting on a bus in a section that's marked for whites only didn't create the tension. The tension's already there. Rosa Parks sat where she sat intentionally to bring to the forefront the imbalance, the injustice that was there. Interestingly, in, if you read the letters from a Birmingham jail, the, the thing that disappointed Martin Luther King the most was that people who agreed with him in principle were unwilling to act with him in practice. And what he sees is that people who are comfortable, who are not uh, feeling the, the heat of the injustice, are trying to just speak for unity and peace and go along to get along, and they're not willing to do what's right. And a lot of the letter from the Birmingham jail is actually calling out that problem that's there. He says this, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed by the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in this stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's consular or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with you in the methods of direct action, who, pater who part paternalistically believes he can set the timetable of another man's freedom, who lives by the mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for, quote-unquote, a more convenient season. You can see why this was divisive in its time. Martin Luther King was not content to just try to go the one direction and plead his own case, he was wondering why he was lacking the support. 
Let me just close with a, a quote that encourages us to follow through as the early Christians did. He says this, The early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. The church was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Do you see the difference there? The thermometer just says, what's, te what's the temperature? Yep, it's 70. The thermostat says, no, we want it to be 71. We want it to be 72. We are agents of change by God's grace because we're part of this stone, this great kingdom that's infusing the kingdoms of this world and waiting, as it were, the colony of heaven to come into place. So that's just a, a quick word about civil disobedience, and I commend to you uh, reading Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, letters to, from a Birmingham jail. Come back to our text here in verse, 13, or verse 15, we see this. Nebuchadnezzar's hard pressure comes across like this, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a fiery furnace, a burning fiery furnace. And I love this question, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Uh-oh. Nebuchadnezzar, you just put your dukes up. And we see the saints in their nonconformity, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And their reply shows that they are ones who want to put themselves as saints in the hands of a mighty God. They're presented with another opportunity to bow down, but they agree at, at the very forefront they're not even going to talk about going there. They're going to just tell them, it doesn't matter if you set this thing up again, you might as well just throw us straight in there because we're not going to go bow down. Don't, don't drag us way back out to that plane again. Uh, we're just not going to do it. That's, how, that's basically their answer, right? They choose instead to testify and to trust. These three men testified of their faith in God and stood their ground, come what may. They were willing to obey God even to the point of painful death. And they themselves know two things. God is able to deliver them, and they will not bow down to a false god. Their answer, therefore, comes in verse 17. Uh, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Now, note here that all they claim that God is going to do is that he is able they don't know or have a promise that God will preserve them or that they will live through this fiery furnace because it's never happened before that anyone's gone into such a flame and come out okay. It was all, and you can't presume on God for miracles, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know that. So then why do they say, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king? Because they know that they're in a win-win position. Are you with me? If they are preserved, then the king is false and they are true. And if they're not preserved, they don't have to answer that king anymore. They're going to be right face to face with King Jesus. As Paul said, for me to live is gain, or for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's this attitude right here back in Daniel chapter 3 from Philippians 1. It's the same, same idea. And so they say, God is able. Now, verse 18 is the finale. They say this, but if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And there's that phrase, but if not. They are going to obey no matter what. They are going to go forward regardless of the consequences because they put their trust in God. And as you read verse 17 and verse 18, it says, we serve our God, we will not serve your God. Now, you're going to have to wait till next week to find out the rest of the story. <laughs> will our friends live through the fire? What will happen? Tune in next week when you'll find out from Pastor Peter. But for now, let's close with Nebuchadnezzar's question in verse 15. I want to go back to his question because it really actually serves the purpose of this message. Nebuchadnezzar asks this question, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Well, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm so glad you asked. Who is that God indeed? Hananiah can tell you. That's Shadrach, by the way. Hananiah, his real name in Hebrew means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is the loving 
merciful God who gives us his favor even though we've committed treason against the Almighty. That God is able to deliver me from your hand. Mishael, he can tell you. His name means who is like Elohim, who is like God. The rhetorical answer, of course, to that question, who is like God, is no one. There's no one like our God. Among the gods, there is no one like you. Our God is taller than your statue, King Nebuchadnezzar. Our God doesn't have to be set up, as we read over and over again. King Nebuchadnezzar set up this God, set up this thing, set up this statue. He has to keep setting it up because it's about to get hit by that stone and it's about to be toppled. Who is like the Lord? And who is the God who will deliver you? See, we got another brother. Who is it? Hananiah, Mishael. Oh, Azariah. I didn't even write that in my notes. Azariah can tell you who this God is. Azariah, his name means God is my strong helper. God is my Aetzer. That God can deliver me. That God will deliver me. That God is my strong helper when I am plagued by my sin and misery and deserving of death. That God comes and helps me. He doesn't accuse me or condemn me or reject me, but he loves me. That's my God. That God can deliver me, O king. Who is the God who will deliver you? The triune God of the Bible will deliver you. The father who sent his son into the world to die for the treason against the Godhead, that father will save you. That son who laid down his life on the cross and died in your place, he has saved you. He has delivered you. That Holy Spirit who causes you to be born again into this living hope that can never perish, spoil or fade, that Holy Spirit will deliver you from your darkness. That Holy Spirit will wake you up and make you see the light that it is God and God alone who is able to save. That's our God. That's our God who, will, who can deliver us. And praise God, we have been delivered by so great a salvation. Are you with me? Praise God, we've been delivered by a God by so great a a salvation. Long time ago, our Savior Jesus was identified as an enemy of the state. He gave the good confession. He said, I am the king of the Jews. And he went to the cross, which was the fiery furnace. But the wrath of an almighty God, rightfully deserving against the sin of man, he took the heat. When you are loved like that, you know where your allegiance lies. When you are delivered like that, you know your life is secure. When you know who is the God who will rescue you, you too can reply, we will not serve your puny little gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. When you know that you are eternally secure, you too can answer, but if not. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you alone are God. There is none like you. We thank you that you are the one who can and has delivered us from the fiery furnace of the wrath that we deserve for our sin. We thank you that you are not only able to save us, but you have saved us. And we thank you that because we have been secured in our redemption and our rescue, our deliverance by you, now we can live new and transformed lives with kingdom confidence. Help us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen.